good morning to everybody and uh, thanks especially to those who, who made the trek over here in person and, and of course good morning to folks who are joining us um, online. It is really my honor um, to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Michaela West, uh, MD, PhD, um, grew up in eastern Wisconsin. Um, she earned her undergraduate degree at the University of Wisconsin at Madison and completed medical school at the Loyola Stritch School of Medicine in Chicago prior to completing surgical and critical care training and her PhD at the University of Minnesota in Minneapolis. She's, a board she's board certified in general surgery and surgical critical care, and she has extensive experience in general emergency and trauma surgery. She has served on the academic faculty at multiple uh, universities you will have heard of, including Washington University in St. Louis, University of Minnesota, uh, Northwestern, and um, our neighbor up north, University of California, San Francisco. Dr. West currently serves as the Trauma Research Chair at North Memorial Healthcare, a level one trauma center in Minneapolis. Dr. West is a professor of surgery at the University of Minnesota and emeritus professor at UCSF, where she served as the Chief of Trauma at San Francisco General. She has authored more than 260 peer-reviewed papers, um, mostly related to sepsis and surgical infections, as well as some other topics. Dr. West um, came out as a transgender woman later in her career and um, is really uh, generous in sharing her story with us today. I look forward to hearing her insights on how we um, as healthcare professionals can take better care of our transgender patients. I also wanna note that Dr. West has a passion for skiing and is a ski instructor. Um, she's also a proud grandparent to seven um, grandchildren. On a personal note, I've um, met Dr. West through some work that we've done related to sexual harassment in medicine. And it's really been, um, I've been really grateful to know her and um, really impressed by the way that she um, communicates about her experiences. And, and that's why we were so excited to bring her here today. And um, I'm gonna uh, stop gathering and uh, turn it over to Dr. West. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for that uh, for that introduction. It's, it's always intimidating to be introduced by someone and you go, it doesn't even sound like me. Uh, but I am very happy to be here. She, uh, Dr. Salas is right that I am an enthusiastic skier and speaking of the kind of before times that the last time or one of the times that I was in California, I was out skiing and around Lake Tahoe and it was two days before everything shut down, that all the ski areas shut down in Colorado, California, and everyone kind of went on lockdown in March of, of 2020. So um, I, uh, this is my topic. I'm gonna talk about transforming healthcare, clever little word, play on words there. I have nothing to disclose. Identity is important. It's important to all of us, and it's important to me. I identify as a woman surgeon, a surgeon and a woman. Let me tell you the story about the importance of those two components of my identity. Becoming a woman surgeon was particularly difficult for me because I was born a boy. Identity can be defined as who a person is, but it's important. It's also importantly how the world sees us. When I, when the, when I was born, the world saw me as a boy and anatomically I was male. Psychologists tell us that identity begins in infancy. I don't really remember my infancy, but I have clear recollections of my early childhood. Personally, I've never embraced a common trans trope of feeling like a girl trapped in a boy's body. Even at a young age, I understood how things were. As a five or six year old, I remember wishing that I'd been born a girl, even praying at bedtime that I'd wake up to have magically become one, but that never happened. In, oops, in grade school, many of my playmates and closest friends were girls. Oops, oh, oh, I've got, there we go. All right, uh, closest friends were girls. Later social pressure and the onset of puberty changed those friendships, although many continued into high school where I hung out with a 10 girl posse. During high school, my focus was a million miles from medicine. I was artsy, bookish, and creative, concentrating on art, theater, and photography. When I enrolled at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, I was an art major with more than 24 hours of studio classes every week. I was quite good at art, getting straight A's in all my classes. What about my gender identity? 
that conflict was still there, but now I was able to access information from the medical library. I researched treatment for transsexuals, the term of the day, but things didn't look promising. People like me were portrayed as very disturbed individuals. In 1973, it was apparent that there really weren't any good options. While I was restless in the early 70s, so was the country and the world. I aspired to help people and make the world a better place and questioned whether art was the best way to do that. One of my closest friends switched from a math physics major to pre-med. The idea of a selfless profession that helped people was a powerful draw. It would also be a distraction that would let me focus on others, not on myself. So I switched. Never mind that I hadn't taken any science or math classes since sophomore year of high school. I could do this. I had a purpose and a goal. I threw myself into my classes, worked in a research lab, cancer research lab, and volunteered in the emergency department. Surgery was also de demanding. I matched at the University of Minnesota, as you heard, into a program that emphasized training future academic leaders and expected residents to obtain a PhD during their training. By the end of residency, I'd written an NIH R01 grant for my mentor and published 23 peer-reviewed papers. I was a surgeon. Women are often told that we can't have it all and have to focus on the most important things, but surgery was very important part of my identity. I tried to ignore my gender conflict and focus on my career in academic surgery. I was promoted to professor first at the University of Minnesota, then Northwestern University and UCSF. I held numerous uh, surgical leadership positions and rose to the upper echelons of surgery. By the early 2000s, I could no longer ignore my gender dysphoria. I sought medical and psychiatric help and was finally able to admit to myself that I was a transgender woman. Now what? Medical therapy with testosterone blockers and estrogen helped a lot. I felt much better. The medication also resulted in some significant physical changes, but I, while I was very okay with those changes, others were not, including my wife. She agreed that we could stay married as long as my gender identity remained a secret. But within a couple of years, more than 60 people came to know that closely held secret and after 36 years of marriage, she decided that she'd had enough. She filed for divorce, eliminating my last excuse for not transitioning. I came out in December of 2013, and I officially became Michaela on January 2nd of 2014. Kind of a little thing here, then the driver's license, it is still has my legal name of Michael at that time, but the date of issue is the 26th of December, uh, 2013. Um, uh, became officially became Michael Michaela on uh, January 2nd of 2014. A year later, I had gender confirming surgery and I was finally the woman that I'd always wanted to be. Now that should have been my happy ending, but it wasn't. The woman part was wonderful. Other women were very welcoming socially and professionally, but my decision to transition necessitated my quote unquote retirement from UCSF under a settlement. I no longer had a job, and I was unable to get hired by anyone for more than three years. My outness created fantastic new opportunities, such as being invited to be a member of the American Surgical Association's Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion Task Force, becoming a founding and steering committee member of Time's Up Healthcare, and joining the board of the uh, Association of Women Surgeons Foundation. And thankfully, my ex and I remain best friends. Eventually, I obtained a part-time non-clinical job to oversee trauma research at a level one trauma center in Minneapolis, but I still identified as a surgeon. I wanted to have it all. My employer was willing to create a non-paid re-entry pathway that entailed more than six months of supervised surgery, trauma, and ICU care. In the summer of 2019, shortly after my 65th birthday and a time when many of my colleagues were retiring, I was granted surgical privileges and returned to clinical practice. I was now back on call, back in the ICU and back in the operating room. Identity is important and I am here before you identifying as a woman surgeon. Now, 
part one of the the things that has come out of all this is that I that I recognize the privilege that that I have. And that privilege has ended up resulting in kind of an academic rebirth where where now in terms of this, you know, newly discovered area of of DEI uh, research and inclusion and opinion pieces and all that, I have been sought out for my opinions and have authored a number of papers, et cetera. So what, what is, goes into my privilege? Well, one, I'm, I'm white, I'm highly educated, I'm able-bodied. I was raised uh, in a middle or upper middle class. I'm a US citizen, I speak English, and I don't appear to many people to be transgender. Now, some might disagree with that, but that is that I pass. Now, the idea of passing is, is a little bit uh, loaded kind of term. It, it refers to the ability of somebody who has a different gender identity to navigate life without others assuming that they are transgender. And it can be problematic because the idea of passing implies being something that you're not. And, and another closely related term is stealth, and that connotes deceit. Um, so, but the problem is that transgender individuals living as their authentic selves really are not trying to be deceptive or misleading. Um, and many trans people strongly oppose the presumption that all transgender people want to pass as either male or, or female. Um, and some consciously and intentionally present in a, in a different way. So, it's been suggested that rather than talking about pass, passing or stealth, that using the terms visibly transgender or not visibly transgender, you know, may be more politically correct. For me, identifying as a woman, it certainly makes my life easier. And frankly, I don't think that I have the personal fortitude or courage to have transitioned if I was not able to kind of do that. Now, something that Dr. Salas had suggested that I talk about is, and we've spoken about before, is the, the kind of thing that can happen, particularly in academia, with microaggressions. And LGBTQ individuals are more susceptible to microaggressions. Uh, not infrequently with microaggressions, somebody, somebody could say, well, that's not what I meant, but it doesn't matter what you meant, it's what they ended up hearing. And things that, that sound perhaps even somebody's trying to be complimentary, oh my God, you don't look chance or uh, you know, something like that can actually be hurtful to some people. So micro sounds really small, but in fact, it can have cumulative uh, uh, stress and, and uh, trauma that the, um, it can affect people's emotional well-being, their psychological adjustment, and mental health, it can have cognitive effects in terms of um, uh, interpreting incidents and things that happen and disrupt cognitive uh, processing, et cetera, and it can affect people's behavior. The other thing that can end up happening, and it actually ended up happening to me, is that, uh, and I've heard of a number of other instances of this within academia, is what some have referred to as weaponization of patient safety. So we can say, and, and human resources and things like that would say, you know, if you've got a problem, we're going to protect you, et cetera. But I'm here to tell you that when anybody raises the question about something uh, occurring that might be putting patients at risk or patients uncomfortable or something like that, it suddenly takes on a whole different um, uh, flavor. And, and it's like, okay, well, you know, your rights are certainly important, but we have to protect patient safety. So, and what's very easy for somebody to do is bring up things about, you know, vague accusations from anonymous, anonymous sources of staff, residents, or students that, I don't know, I, th this individual makes me feel uncomfortable, or I think patients are concerned, or I don't know that their judgment is right. Uh, greater scrutiny at m and conferences, that's a real kind of a key uh, surgical training conference. And then even, even to the extent of public criticism or, or questioning on, on rounds or something like that, that, that invalidating someone's opinion in, in front of, of their colleagues or, or students. And something that I was subject to uh, that I kind of refer to as a whisper campaign, 
where somebody plants the seeds of concerns about someone, and then it kind of can, it's a little bit like the telephone game and it can kind of expand. So somebody would, could innocently be saying, do, do you have any concerns about, about Dr. West's judgment? And that other individual might be going, no, not at all. I, I think that they're fine. But now that seed has been planted. And then the next time something happens, or especially if one or two other people, you know, so-and-so talked to me about Dr. West. We, have you had any problems? I haven't, but yeah, I've been hearing that too. And it begins to undermine your um, credibility. So one of the things I wanted to talk about here to all this is the, and, and it's a little bit like bringing Coles to Newcastle kind of thing about talking about LGBTQ plus broadly issues uh, in the Bay Area is maybe a little bit crazy, but I've given a similar kind of talk before and everybody doesn't have it and it still doesn't hurt to, to talk about it. Um, I, I've already encountered a couple of things here that would suggest that Stanford is very aware of the fact that LGBTQ healthcare is here, but I show this image just to show that, that you're not alone in this. It is a big thing of, of many healthcare systems and academic medical centers that they are marketing to this population and falling all over themselves to say, we are more LGBTQ inclusive now. The fact that they say that and they've got slick ads doesn't necessarily make it so, but nonetheless, it is a demographic that they're uh, trying to go after. A couple of things, and, and again, this may be clear to everyone, is just kind of talking about some, some de definitions here. I won't go through all of, of them um, that I, as I said, that I relate as a transgender person, but actually in my day-to-day -day identity, someone had um, mentioned several years ago when Facebook ended up coming up with 70 different descriptors of, of what your gender identity is, say, well, we're now, so now that you've got that, what, what have you chosen? I said, I still identify as female. That's, that's it. It's, it's, there's no other things. And I don't identify, I don't walk up to somebody and say, hi, I'm Dr. Michaela West. I'm a trans woman or something like that. that that's on a need to know uh, kind of basis. Um, the the other things that are kind of important here, especially as it relates to um, to some issues with with trans, and I'm going to show you some things about how it relates on the medical record, is the idea. Th this is the kind of current terminology: is assigned female or assigned male at birth, because there actually are aspects of our medical care where that may be important to to know what organs were they born with. Or, or not, uh, because there are intersex kind of things, uh, et cetera. Um, I think the rest of these terms are pretty self-explanatory. And I wanna go into some specifics about, about transgender uh, patients and individuals. What healthcare providers need to know about transgender patients. First of all, not all transgender individuals seek either medical or surgical interventions. I think that there is a popular misconception, particularly in the politically charged lay press right now that everybody is going out and at you know eight years old having gender affirming surgery or something like that. Even as adults, only 20% of people end up going uh, for surgical interventions and about half end up being on hormonal therapy. Now, as it becomes more accepted, those numbers may change and, and there are barriers, especially to surgery. It may be that, that more would want surgery if it was available and and it was paid for with their healthcare, but that's a, another issue. So it is important that, that also as providers, that you are aware of the specific anatomy, uh, medications that somebody might be on and the risk factors that, that would uh, go back to the organs that they might've been born with. So, and preventive care, cancer screening, et cetera, largely relate to those, those organs. And one thing that is, is makes it easier is once you know what those organs are or what their sex assigned at birth was, that those preventive and cancer screening things are pretty much the same as they would be for cisgender individuals at the same age. Now, I'm here to tell you that the effects of hormones are pretty profound, um, not only in terms of physical changes, but in terms of uh, emotional, uh, sensory, all, all kinds of, of different things. Uh, and some of those changes are reversible and some of them are, are irreversible. And that seems to be kind of important to some people as, 
as they're talking about, about whether there should be kind of a gatekeeper thing for somebody to get cross-sex hormones, uh, I, I think that the, I can tell you that the next standards of care for um, uh, care of transgender gender individuals is going to very much de-emphasize that and, and say that sort of anybody who wants it could, could be getting the cross-sex hormones. So if there's a trans man, they could be getting testosterone. If there's a trans woman, they could be getting estrogen. And just to be um, informed that, you know, there are, some, there are some risks as there are with any medication that we end up prescribing to someone. And some of the things that are even irreversible can, might be able to be dealt with medically or surgically if, if that came up. Uh, one of the things that comes up and right now is rarely covered by uh, any health plans is uh, facial feminization or masculinization surgery. I think one of the fascinating aspects of this is just as you look at some of these, these uh, images uh, that you look at this individual who uh, identified as a trans man, that the, the difference in the facial structure is very subtle or here is someone who was born male and uh, was a trans woman and they had some of that. It, it is something that I come to learn about plastic surgery that when I was a resident, you know, taking a millimeter or something uh, off of a cartilage in the nose could completely change the shape of the nose. It's very subtle uh, differences in some of these things. That's not something that, that I've, I've had, but I do think that it's quite, uh, quite amazing. Um, Chest surgery is, is very common for either uh, gender. It is the most common operation. I was told when I was living here um, it, when, with Healthy San Francisco Initiative and suddenly that uh, things like that became available, that the plastic surgeons that I spoke to at, at Kaiser said that 90% of what they were doing was top surgery on, on um, trans men. So that is, that is a very, very common uh, thing. And I will also tell you that that contrary to what I had always thought, that the, uh, the prevalence of trans men and trans women is about 50-50. Uh, it's very, very close to 50-50. It's certainly not like 80-20, 80% 80 being, being people who identify uh, as trans women. And a, a lot of trans women would be unhappy with the amount of breast growth that they have uh, under the influence of hormones, although it's I think it's a good idea for somebody to wait a couple years for that to, to develop. So they may end up having breast augmentation in some way. Um, for trans women, the vaginoplasty procedure is the most common uh, bottom surgery that ends up getting done. I like to say it's a very green operation. That's almost nothing is wasted or thrown away. Everything is just recycled in, in different uh, ways. So the glands of the penis becomes the neoclitoris, the shaft of the penis becomes the, the uh, neo-vagina, the testicles are thrown away, uh, but, but everything else is, is used. The scrotum becomes the uh, labia majora and, and menorah. Importantly, and importantly for cancer screening, is that the prostate gland is almost never removed. Prostatectomy is a big operation and pretty bloody, and it can end up impacting uh, sexual uh, function and, and things like that. So it's almost uh, never done. I should also say that on the top surgery uh, or on the, I'll go back, uh, on, the, on the chest surgery, trans men under the influence of testosterone, that they do form breast tissue. I mean, you can even lactate in, in some cases with the right hormone mix. So they are at risk for breast cancer. I mean, even cis men are at risk for breast cancer, but trans men might be at a greater risk trans or trans women might be at a greater risk. Trans men, even though they have, they end up having this um, uh, masculinization of the chest, there is still some residual uh, breast cells and tissue. So it's still possible. It's not like a, a prophylactic or a subcutaneous mastectomy that people might get for like having a BRCA uh, thing or, or something like that. It is not a cancer preventative operation. It is probably removing 90% of the breast tissue. So yeah, there might be a 90% reduction, but there are some cells that are, that are left. 
Uh, and, and this is the, the uh, external appearance for um, genital surgery in, in trans women um, right immediately post-op. It doesn't look so you know, tremendously uh, good, but here, you know, after things have healed up and the, and the scars have faded, it, it looks quite uh, convincing and would allow for penetrative intercourse if that was desired. For trans men, um, there are a couple oper operative options on the bottom kind of surgery. The most complicated, and it really is quite complicated, is a phalloplasty procedure where there's a free flap, either from the thigh or from the forearm, an innervated uh, vascularized free flap to create a, a neophallus. Importantly, in trans men, if that kind of thing has happened, some trans men would have a hysterectomy for, for several reasons. It's quite rare for um, trans men to have a vaginectomy or have a vulvectomy. So, uh, and if they had a partial hysterectomy where the cervix is left behind, then they still could be at risk for uh, cervical cancer. And we can maybe end up talking about this, this later. It is potentially a, a little bit of a triggering kind of event on exam to be suggesting that you need to be checking some of these things, but it, is, it may be medically important. The other kind of more common things with, for trans men is just under the influence of testosterone, there'll be significant clitoral um, hypertrophy that there is a procedure called a metoidioplasty where the suspensory ligament of the clitoris is severed, which makes that um, uh, hypertrophied clitoris kind of neo, neophallus uh, be a little bit more projectile, but it's probably only gonna be a few centimeters in, in uh, length and, and perhaps a centimeter or two in, um, in kind of girth. And then at the bottom of this slide, you can, you can see the, the phalloplasty kind of uh, procedure, which ends up involving some fairly big scars to go and get your vascular uh, and other hookup, and then a uh, skin graft at the donor site. So it is a moderately morbid uh, operation. In order for that neophallus to have erectile function, there would need to be an, an implant of some kind, either an inflatable implant or a semi-rigid uh, implant. Well, what do the patients say about what we're doing? It's not good. <laughs> I mean, here is a paper that, that the title is sometimes you feel like the freak show when they ended up doing this kind of uh, qualitative research of asking trans individuals what they, they thought. So how can we do better? Well, there are a couple of things. In, with the um, adoption of the Affordable Care Act, it was a requirement that all of the electronic health record things end up having some of these features to, ident to have multiple choices for someone's gender identity. Now, we as providers rarely are doing this kind of registration thing, but it's something that you could educate the people who are registering someone to be asking those questions about what would you what would you like? I mean, we've got all of these, these uh, choices here about that they are, uh, that it's a binary gender, that they're non-binary, that they're trans, that they're trans man, trans woman, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, here's some, some more options. I did look up that my understanding is that you've got Epic here and that's what we have as, as well. I, I've used Cerner in the past. I don't like it as much, but, um, but here are, are some of the things where you could, you could see that here is, is this individual uh, and we can see that their pronouns are identified here that their gender identity is there, that their legal sex or their sex assigned at, at birth is here as female. In addition to that kind of thing that is within the record, that also when, when the wristbands and things like that are printed out, the wristband can end up incorporating both their legal name and their preferred name and their preferred gender. So that when you navigate, and if anybody has navigated as a patient, through anything or had a surgical procedure that every time you encounter a new person, what is your name? What is your date of birth? You know, get, give me all this stuff. So it's going to be very, it's going to be very traumatic for someone who has changed their name to be saying, you know, I'm, I'm John Smith. I'm, I'm not Emily Smith or, or something like that, but it's going to be on there and, and that could be, could be checked. So, um, 
There is that. A few tips for working with or caring for trans individuals. Don't ask them intimate questions out of curiosity. Don't ask trans individuals about their gender uh, genital status unless it is directly related to patient care. And then it is important for you to explain the rationale about why this is important. You know, sorry to ask you this, but I need to ask about this because of, you know, blah, blah, blah. Refer to transgender individuals by their preferred name and pronoun. If you're unsure about someone's gender identity or how they wish to be addressed, it's simply easy to just ask them politely for clarification. And I think that sometimes people will kind of feel like they're tiptoeing around this and I don't really wanna ask. But if you are, if you are asking earnestly and, and honestly, like what, you know, what is your gender identity? We, we do this as, as physicians, you know, you think about all kinds of things that you end up asking somebody, do you have sex, you know, you're asking a man, do you have sex with other men? Now, there are going to be some, I don't know what, old grandpas or something like that who are going to say, what do you mean? Why would I ever, like, okay, I'm just asking. I've got to ask these questions. I'm a doctor. I, you know, it's important. Some people do. So you can do that. Never disclose a trans gender person or LGBTQ person's status to anyone who doesn't need that information. That is really their information to share. It's not yours. And the presence of a transgender person on the service is not always a teachable moment. So what do trans uh, patients say that they want from medical providers? They want to be treated with respect. They want to be accepted for who they are. They want to be treated according to what their needs are, and they want you to meet their needs with competence. So every interaction holds the potential to be a dignity encounter. And by that, I mean an interaction in which dignity is either violated or it's promoted. So let's promote dignity. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. West. And for those who are on Zoom, um, please feel free to put your uh, questions into the q and I'll be monitoring those. Um, and then for those who are in the room um, and have any questions, uh, just, you know, like old school in the before times, <laughs> raise your hand. Um, and uh, I, I just appreciate everything um, that you that you shared with us. I have quite a few questions um, that I can start with if uh, while people are gathering their thoughts. Um, so one is, you know, we talked about this a little bit last night, um, that we don't always have to ask people about their transgender status, right? As in, in the healthcare context, it's not always relevant to the care the person's coming in for, for example, if they have, I don't know, a headache or something. Um, so when is it important that a healthcare provider ask someone um, that, or is it ever? Well, I'm I, I don't know. I mean, I think you have to, you have to individualize If Somebody came in and I don't know what, you know, came to the ER and they had a bloody nose or they had a laceration or something that's really not terribly, terribly important. Uh, sometimes you're going to get a little perhaps of that information. If somebody is taking uh, other um, cross-sex hormones or something like that, because you'd say, you know, are you allergic to any medicine? What medications are, are you taking? Um, but you can just like list that if somebody said, well, I'm, I'm taking, I'm taking estrogen I'm taking this, like, wait a minute, why are you taking estrogen? So that's a little bit more intrusive in the same way that if you, they went down and say, you know, I take some Lasix and, and I'm on a statin and like statin, why are you taking a statin? Like, do you, do you have like high cholesterol? Do you eat badly? Like what? So we, we can, we don't need to to go off in those places and and we should be quite you know good at that and then the other part of it is that if you do get that information as you're taking that history it doesn't then need to be something that when you go back to you know enter that or you're talking to somebody else hey you know that person who came in before with a nosebleed you know they're they're trans you know, i or you know so that is kind of respecting that sort of thing and the, and the same would go for you know if if they're they're married do, you know do they have children etc. There's all kinds of questions that don't necessarily impact uh, some conditions that we see somebody for. Yeah, absolutely. But primary care would be you know kind of different. 
Right. Right. No, that makes sense. Um, and relevant to um, or related to one of the things you brought up in your talk when you asked about or when you were talking about how trans women most often will still have a prostate um, and trans men who have um, still have a cervix are still susceptible, of course, to cervical cancer. Um, what, and you said um, that it's important to be sensitive about how to approach patients in that circumstance when you know that, say, it's a trans man and, and you want to examine their, their cervix. Do you have any um, thoughts on how to be, be how to approach that situation? Well, I so I'm not an OBGYN and I'm not a primary caregiver, but I, I would think in 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 terms of communicating with some trans men that I know that going and having the the usual uh, kind of clinic situation one you know even going to an OBGYN clinic somebody comes in with a a beard and all that say well this is where we do that kind of test that's going to be making them a little bit uncomfortable to begin with. If you even skip that and you're just in a regular thing to say, okay, you know, get, get here, we're gonna put the back of the table up, put your legs in stirrups or something like that. I would think that might be kind of triggering uh, for them a, as well. And there would be ways that somebody could get that, that um, you know, first of all, it'd be important to explain the rationale why you're doing this. Shouldn't be something you're doing every time because, you know, women don't get a pep smear every uh, every year or every six months or something when they come in. But I would I would imagine that maybe you could have somebody go in kind of a lateral decubitus position or something like that, use the smallest speculum that would be, you know, be possible because probably there's been some some atrophy and things like that of the vagina if they're not having penetrative uh, intercourse with with their vagina any anymore, and I mean that that actually same thing applies. I know a number of of lesbian women who um, get concerned about that same kind of thing that they they get a little bit triggered that that's just not what they're identifying with and they don't they don't like that. Yeah, no, I appreciate it. Um, oh, sorry, what? Get a time signal. Oh no, no, okay. no, no, we're good, we're good. Um, so there's a few questions coming through on the uh, Zoom. Please go ahead and continue to put those in. Um, uh, they're great questions. Um, so one is, are there national centers of excellence for gender um, affirming surgery? Yes and no. Um, I, I think that there are becoming some of those. I, I think that one of the things that has, um, I think this kind of happened is that in general, and, and Stanford, back in the day was an exception and Johns Hopkins back in the, in the day in the, in the 60s and 70s was kind of an exception. But in general, academic medical centers have not embraced this and have not led this. It really has been kind of a private clinic sort of, of thing. I think it's kind of entrepreneurial. I think that a number of people who are doing uh, or in the past have done gender affirming surgery uh, we're making a lot of money with, with that. Uh, I mean, it's very lucrative. And there are clinics in Mexico and in Thailand and, and things like that where people are paying kind of cash on the barrel head, $25 or $40 or $50,000 or more to you know, end up getting this procedure. It hasn't, I don't think, been, been rigorously studied. Uh, I, uh, there's not, in, in trauma, we've got something called the National Trauma Quality Im Improvement Program and the National Surgical Quality Improvement Program that ends up being a database that everybody puts their information in. It's risk adjusted so that you can truly compare apples to apples across things. I think something like that would be wonderful for some of these kinds of things to really have evidence-based guidelines about what the what the best practices are but that doesn't exist right now um, it's beginning to exist I, I was on the writing committee for this um, world professional association for transgender health uh, standards of care eight it's get, got featured very prominently in the new york times magazine about six weeks ago uh, where one of the pediatricians uh, was talking about the the fact that it's very controversial about uh, hormone blockers in uh, adolescent kids, whether that is right or not. And he was getting some hate mail and, and threats to his family about the fact that he had written about that. And I'm anticipating that maybe I'll get some of that when things come out about, about, about the surgical care. But there, 
it, it really is more, it was a Delphi process to, to get at this. So it's expert opinion, it's knowledgeable expert opinion. And now way back to your beginning question about are there centers of, of excellence? I think that uh, the University of Michigan is trying to be doing something with that. I think that Mass General is trying to, to do something. Like, finally, as you saw from my marketing slide that some of these academic centers are getting interested, are saying that it actually is an intellectually interesting uh, question. It's worth studying. It's worth devoting the resources to and getting people to, to do it. So I think, I hope that that will change and that there'll be more, but there's very few right now. Yeah. And it sounds like, did I catch that, that you're saying there's going to be some surgical standards of care that are coming out? Well, it's going to come out. I mean, there, there's been ones in the past. Uh, it, it is just some as I say, it, it's really not based on, there's not a grade methodology that can be applied to, to this because there are not prospective randomized studies of, of two different you know, ways of, of doing something. And, and it's surprising how many variations there can be about any number of those things, about how you're dosing, you know, how often, what, what dose, what route, et cetera, et cetera, for medication and for surgery. There's so many, many variables, and it can make a real difference. Yeah, well, um, I'm glad that people are, are working on this and at least collecting expert opinion while we're hoping that data will be collected um, so we can practice evidence-based medicine. Um, there are a few more questions in the, in the Zoom Q&A. So one is um, about, or actually two are about hormone therapy. So I don't know if you want to go back to that slide that you had with... Um, all the oh, side effects changes. Um, yeah, and all the changes. The, the two questions were, one was asking about side effects of hormone therapy, and the other one was specifically um, usage of hormone therapy in individuals who are over 60 and whether there are any special considerations um, there. Well, um, the, there, are, there are some side effects, and one of the common side effects that, that people had talked about, and that actually has been studied, in a, in a couple of, even like it was a meta-analysis, so there was enough literature about it, was whether uh, administration of estrogens, particularly to older trans women, increased their thromboembolic risk. And it appears that that is, is not the case. Now, when I tried looking up, what are the, what is the risk because of that longer exposure, it could be 10, 20, 30 years of of um, exogenous estrogen for development of, of breast cancer, for example. There are only 18 cases in the literature of breast cancers in trans women that I, that I was able to find. So that would suggest that actually it's a pretty low risk. And some OBGYN people that, that I'm aware of, um, actually in the Bay Area, and, but I won't name them, uh, ha have said that you know maybe that kind of concern that has historically been there about giving postmenopausal women uh, hormone supplementation is wrong in part because in the past when that was done, it was they were giving like birth control pills. So it was a combination of estrogen and progesterone. It might've been the progesterone that was really more uh, cancerogenic or, or whatever. And we've got a lot of other ways to be following people now. So I don't know that there really is a tremendous risk in someone if they were having, if there was a cis woman who was having all kinds of symptoms to say, you know, okay, well, let's see if that gets rid of your symptoms and you feel better, but we're going to maybe have to follow you pretty closely. On the, the um, trans man, I think that, that um, testosterone can have a little bit of an increased risk for some uh, liver kind of tumors, some he uh, hepatomas or something like that, but I'm not, I'm not positive. Um, yeah, it's important, like you said, any therapy that we um, prescribe for folks is going to have some um, side effects and, and potentially adverse uh, effects as well. So it's important to be aware. Well, of and those. Just on, on that point, a, an interesting thing about with many of these medications that so we talk about them as side effects in somebody who is seeking it out because of their gender identity, those side effects may be their desired effects. So for example, that that you could have a uh, a man who's got bad heart failure and you put them on spironolactone and they're going to be very distressed about the fact that they've got some gynecomastia and, and breast enlargement and their libido has gone in the toilet. 
So they may be very concerned about that, but a trans woman may say, this is great, I love this. Or, or hirsutism from uh, you know, anti-estrogen kind of therapy for breast cancer, that, that a, a cis woman be very distressed about the fact that they're getting like a, a beard or they're, they're getting really you know, muscled up or something, but a trans man may say, this is great, I'm, I'm loving this. Yeah, that's a great point too. And um, just a quick note to the folks on Zoom, thank you for letting us know about the audio issues. I believe they are resolved um, and we will try to figure out uh, what happened there. We think it may have to do with the internet signal. Um, so there's a couple more questions here. One is about, and I don't know if you've encountered this um, situation or have thoughts on it, but if you have a, a trans, if you're caring for a transgender person who um, doesn't want their medical record to reflect their transgender status, because they've um, really kind of transitioned and they see themselves, like you said, like you see yourself as a woman, not as a transgender woman. Um, and so they, they, it causes dysphoria for them to have it noted in their medical record. Um, any thoughts on how to sensitively handle that situation? Well, I, I think I, I was trying to, to show, and I don't know if it, if it ended up displaying so well, but whoops, the fact that, oh, where was it? Uh, that, that it, indeed that the, the records and the name tags and things like that, the, the little sticky that we put on all the charts could say their desired, their desired name. Um, and, and so there's no real reason. I mean, most patients are not necessarily reading their chart and you can just console them about the fact that, you know, we've got this, it's kind of behind this little wall. It's not displayed for, for everyone to see, you know, right up, right up front and basically what is displayed is what is your own identity and your preferred name and pronouns and all of this kind of thing. And then just educate everybody who's taking care of them that that's how you ought to do it. So I, I mean, it, it, it is a, a little bit of, of a problem that, you know, there still is that reality that you, you had this 90, 98, 99% of the time you could navigate through your world at, in your desired identity and name and all that, but there may be a few times where something is, you know, happening that way. And, and in the same way, again, I, I think about lots of other medical conditions. If somebody would say, you know, I don't want to just have my identity be, identity be that I am a diabetic. Okay, so we're not going to have to talk about that every time in every encounter, but there are going to be some times. If your sugar is very low, if your sugar is very high, we have to say, you know, we're going to need to give you some medication because you're a diabetic. I don't want you to say I'm a diabetic. Well, you are. I mean, so we we have to do that, and and we can try and ignore it, but sometimes we can't. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, there, there's a, another question on the Zoom that's um, a, a little bit trickier. I'm going to try to make it something uh, that that we can. Um, engage with, and uh, and I don't mean any disrespect to the person asking the question, I just don't want to put you in a difficult position. They're asking about experiences at UCSF. But what I want to, um, how I want to reframe the question is to say that um, there is a lot of, um, and we talked about this last night at dinner as well, there can be a lot of um, pushback or negativity or just outright discrimination that happens when people um, come out as, as who they are, whether it's related to sexual orientation or gender identity or anything else. Um, and, and our workplaces currently aren't necessarily kind to those individuals. What can we be doing better in our organizations to support people, our colleagues? Um, so we spend a lot of time talking about patients, which is important, but our colleagues who are um, going through, for example, what you went through. Well, I think one one of those things is that there is the that whole concept, and I'd have that as a definition about allyship. And so allyship could be that let's say that that people are on rounds, and someone is maybe it's going to be the attending, probably going to be the attending, not the not the students or or residents or something like that, because whatever they're more clueless and they are they are misgendering or dead naming someone or whatever somebody else can step up and say Sorry, real quick can you explain dead naming okay folks so don't... dead naming is is a thing about if so my name before i changed it to michaela and that i had kept my 
two initials because when you do like a PubMed search, you do like West MA. So I had to figure out like what was going to be some names that I wouldn't like lose access to to all of that. But dead naming would be if someone is is calling me Michael or Mike. Um, I, I don't really appreciate that. That's not the name I use anymore. And and so if you were on rounds and someone was saying, you know, Mike, that's a great that's a great point, then Dr. Salas could say, I, I think you meant Michaela. And that is a good place for somebody else to jump in and say, yeah, that's right. And then that would be a good cue for that person who had misgendered somebody or misnamed somebody to say, I'm sorry, uh, Michaela, and, and you know, go, go on. Not to mention the fact that we should be speaking as, you know, Dr. So-and-so, but not first names or not first names for, uh, for the women. But, you know, and they, and they talked about this kind of famously, like in, um, in the Obama administration, that he had more women in the cabinet and in executive positions, and that those women found that they needed to support one another. Somebody would say, you know, I, I wonder about this. And it would be easy for that person to opinion or whatever to be ignored. So the other women in the room would say, I agree with what, what she had just said. And someone else would say, I do too. So peer pressure can be very effective that way to, to do it. And, and people have talked about calling those kinds of things out in, in the moment that there, there is an opportunity. If it was just one-on-one, -on -one, it would be appropriate to say, you know, um, I, I think you're mistaken. That's not the name I use anymore. And again, that would be a good cue for that individual to say, oh, I, I'm sorry, I, I apologize and, and move forward from there. So it's a, it is a teachable moment. And, and, but that means that everybody else who's there who is more aware of those kinds of issues needs to be on you know, on a little bit of an alert and, and step up. That, that is your opportunity to, to do something and, and not to do it in a really punitive way and yell at that individual who said the wrong thing because, because people don't respond very well. They get defensive if, if you're attacking them. Just say, uh, you know, I think you meant this or, or Dr. So-and-so goes by that name now. And like, oh, okay. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah, we we talk a lot about that in our um, conversations that we have around bias and discrimination more generally, and how we can be upstanders. Um, something we talked about in our leadership retreat in the fall, um, and it's so important for us all to keep working on that. Right. Um, so I have one more question related to colleagues, um, and this is um, just more for you and your experience. Would you say there's like, if I asked you the most um, harmful thing or the, the most annoying thing that you get asked that you wish people wouldn't ask you um, about your experiences? Is there anything really insensitive that people kind of frequently ask you about that, that we shouldn't be asking people, even with the best of intentions, potentially? You know, I, I don't think so. And, and that's, I'm going to come back to my little thing about, about privilege that I don't end up having. It. Now, maybe it's because there are they're talking about that behind my back and they're just not doing it to me. But, um, and at least in the past, people would talk about Minnesota nice. It was like a, a characteristic of people from Minnesota. There are many people who feel very differently about whether that is a, uh, that is a, a real thing. But I've generally had good experiences. Some of the people that I've had bad experiences with, they just don't want to have don't want to interact with me. And, and there are, and actually something that's been very interesting when I did come out is that some people really surprise me in, in their own kind of humanity. Somebody who I would think is like a real redneck, you know, uh, it was like pre-mega, but would be a mega kind of person or something. And they're going, you know, well, I, you, you know, you're my friend and you're still going to be my friend. And I'm like, oh my God, you know, that is wonderful. I, you know, that surprises me that you feel that way, but I, I appreciate it. And the other thing that has been really gratifying is that um, there have been a surprising number of people who have shared with me something about the fact that, you know, I haven't told anybody this before, but my, my child is, you know, struggling with this, or my brother is, you know, is gay, or I had had this or that, you know, I, 
parented a child and I'm, not, I'm like, oh my God, why are you telling me this? But I guess it's because of the fact that, that as I have shared something that, that many people would say, you know, I didn't, I didn't realize that, that, you know, you're, you're trans or I'm just, and, and where it's come up, um, because I, I said that I don't lead with that, but I was in a conversation one, one time um, when I was living in Marin, we were at a book signing or something like that. And I was in this conversation, actually it happened to be somebody who was an anesthesiologist, I think from, from Stanford, a psychiatrist from UCSF. And we're all talking and they're both talking about, about their, their pregnancies and their labor and all this kind of thing. And so one of them who didn't know kind of turned to me and said, you know, my God, I can't believe it. You know, you've got three children. How did you manage this? And I'm like, okay, I didn't want to go here, but I'm now, I am not going to take credit for popping three babies out of me because I didn't do that. Uh, and, and I think that that's like, all right, I'm, I'm going along. I'm basking in, in the fact that people are just taking me as, as another woman and we're having this conversation, but now I've got to be upfront about that. Say, well, I, I didn't actually have my children because I was male at that time. And like, you know, but they're surprised that's fine. But, but in the rest of that conversation, we could be going along and, and, you know, it didn't need to come up, but I do think that, that, and then they might be saying, you know, wow, that thank you for sharing that. And, and now, you know, off in a corner, one of them may end up then sharing something else. So, yeah, the, the power of telling your truth, right? Um, I think connects connects with people. Okay, one last question in our last minute. Um, this question is about the importance of research and data on gender affirming care, and whether there are any best practices that you're aware of on how to run a research program trying to understand or assess these um, best practices and to collect the right data. Well, I think, um, I, I don't think there is a, a best practice. I think that one way that that could be informed is just to be kind of aware of what some of the variables would be. You know, when I was doing research in the lab that I think you've got to, got to be aware of kind of what, what is going on, what might be important variables. And it's not simply like, you know, how many cell, how many cells do I put in a, in addition, and what's the volume of, of this? But there's like a whole bunch of other things about what was added and what are what are other things. So to be talking to those patients or talking to the surgeons or, or aware of of you know different formulations of medications or whatever, so that you are capturing the right information. Because the the thing that I've learned about about databases is that that you know once you have a field, somebody will try to fill that field in, and if you don't have that field and you went back and said, oh, God, you know, the, the really important thing was, you know, uh, were the pills scored and they, you know, broke it in half or do they have a whole pill or, or something like that? And I paid no attention to that. You're never going to get that, that information back. So it is worth taking a little bit of time at the beginning of a database to, to do that and to see whether in, indeed you can get that information that you say you may want. Maybe it's simply not obtainable. It would be great to have, but you're just not going to be able to you know, get that. Yeah, like like all research, the the steps before <laughs> collecting the data are, are are so critical. Uh, as I'm sure the person who who wrote that question um, is is well aware. Um, thank you so much, Dr. West, for sharing your experiences, for coming all the way out here uh, from Minnesota, and for being our first traveling grand round speaker in in a couple of years. And I know we've got your day booked with other meetings and. Um, uh, if, if folks want to get in touch with you, I'll, uh, please uh, contact me and I'll, and I'll put you in touch with Dr. West. Um, and, and I think that's it. We'll close out today. Thank you. We're a couple minutes over. Thank you all for being here, both in person and on Zoom. And thank you once again uh, to Dr. West.